Okay, so I'll be talking today about the ideas of interaction and evolution and the distinction between them in classical and quantum mechanics um, with the goal of uh, trying, to pro uh, trying to propose of uh, working towards a suggestion for a way of conceiving of indefinite causal orders that is uh, perhaps more geometrically uh, and space-time based, since that's what I'm most comfortable with. That's my, that's my background. Um, and hopefully, uh, y'all will be able to tell me if this way of thinking about it is feasible, since y'all are the experts on this and I'm not. And uh, in, in particular, what relation the kinds of operations I have in mind may or may, may, or may not have to um, the framework of process matrices. Because I think, I think there is a connection, but, and I actually meant to sit down and try and work it out about a month ago, and somehow I never found the time to do it. So I, instead of having something more well worked out for you, I have a, 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 a set of suggestions that you can perhaps help me to work out. And some of you have seen some of this before uh, in various places, uh, so I apologize if it's a repeat for some of you, but I know some of you haven't seen any of it. So, so I'm hoping it will still be, but I've, I've reworked it. I reworked the material even for those of you who've seen some of this to make it more, I hope, directly applicable to the goal of trying to discuss indefinite causal orders in this spatio-temporally uh, based way. So just to tell you where we're going, so I'm gonna draw out some, uh, I'm gonna draw out uh, some differences in the, in, the, in the representation and the conceptual and mathematical structure of interaction and evolution in classical and quantum mechanics. And in particular, um, it will uh, there, there will be a, a sense in which, as I'll, I'll, I'll sum up in a moment, the lack of a clear distinction between e interaction and evolution in quantum mechanics, at least as characterized in a certain way um, based in the, in the intrinsic um, algebraic and geometric structure of the dynamics and the concomitant decoupling of the quantum dynamics from background space-time structure, I think that that is what I hope will naturally su will suggest a way to conceive of indefinite causal order. So ju just to let you know where we're going, in classical, and by that I really mean Newtonian mechanics where by a Newtonian system, roughly, I just mean something that satisfies Newton's second law. And also in Lagrangian mechanics, it will turn out that there's a natural equivalence between these two things. We can characterize interaction and evolution as naturally distinguished, physically and conceptually, uh, by, the by the intrinsic algebraic structures of the dynamics alone. It turns out that gives us a natural, without having to assume it a priori, that gives us a natural distinction between configuration and velocity and momentum. It gives us a natural characterization of free evolution. It gives us, in fact, a way to construct the entirety of space-time geometry directly from this, the intrinsic structure of the dynamics. And it also um, yields a clean separation of a system's degrees of freedom from any environment that it's interacting with. This, I, will make, I will make all these claims precise. In Hamiltonian mechanics, it turns out, you get almost none of this. You, there's no natural distinction between interaction and evolution that's intrinsic to the, that you get by analyzing the algebraic structure of the dynamics itself. There's no natural distinction between config, configuration and momentum. You have to impose it by fiat in various ways. There's no natural characterization of free evolution. You cannot reconstruct the background space-time geometry, but there still is, in a certain qualified sense, a clean separation of the system's degrees of freedom from any environment in which it's interacting with. In quantum mechanics, you lose everything. It's a somewhat straightforward generalization from the situation in Hamiltonian mechanics. And for those of you who were here for Bob's talk yesterday, he said something that resonates very strongly with me, that you know, for him, the most, most distinctive about quantum mechanics and how it's different from classical mechanics is, the, is how systems compose, and in particular, the, uh, the notion of entanglement. And I, I, very, I very strongly believe that, and I'm, in fact, I think that the uh, discussion I'm gonna give and a few of the theorems that I'll, I'll state, I'm not gonna give you proofs, don't worry, 
um, they're there. I just don't think it's worth the time and trouble to actually work through them in this talk. It gives, gives one a very, very nice way of seeing why it is that the differences in compositionality and, and the concomitant idea of entanglement really dis completely distinguish quantum uh, systems from classical systems. And from this, I will then propose that one way to think about an indefinite causal order is that one, one, um, on the same Hilbert space of states for the same physical system, one has, very loosely speaking, different sets of Qs and Ts, each satisfying the you know, canonical commutation relation between them. Each set is determined by a different null cone structure in the background space time. The different null cone structures are related by geometrical operations that induce algebraic relations between the sets of the Qs and Ps. And that is where I then get stuck and would like to figure out if there is in fact a relationship between this and the idea of process matrices I suspect there is. Okay, so let's talk about interaction and evolution in Newtonian and Lagrangian mechanics. So what I mean by a classical system as a rough first pass, just to, just to get the, just to get us moving, just get us in the mood, so to speak, nothing very precise yet. Uh, we have, a, it's characterized by a space of states, which weirdly enough is always even dimensional. That's, that's actually something that's really worth, I think thinking, really worth one uh, pondering why it is that classical systems always have even dimensional spaces of states. I think that's a very deep question and I don't really understand it, but it's the fact. It's, if you like, it's a brute empirical fact. Every single classical system we've ever discovered and dealt with has an even dimensional space of states. The evolution is governed by Newton's second law. I'll, I'll make a little bit more precise what I mean by that in a moment. So there's a family of vector fields on the space of states whose integral curves are the possible dynamical evolutions. An interaction in this context, wh what I mean by that is applying an external force. So ch changing from one dynamical uh, evolution path to another. And that can also be represented by a family of vector fields. The possible interactions can be represented by a family of vector fields on the space of states. They're the vector fields that take you from one dynamical vector field to another. And it turns out there's a, a distinguished notion of free evolution, uh, of isolation, no external force. And all of this, I claim, follows from the intrinsic algebraic and geometrical structures of what it means for a system to obey Newton's second law. Please. No. No, no, no. I mean, space I mean, space, space. We'll get to configuration space in a, in a little while. But at, at this point, I should emphasize at this point, I am not distinguishing between configuration and velocity or configuration and momentum. There's just, I, I have some system, I can hit it with a stick, I can prod it with a, you know, I can, I, I, I can turn on some electric charges, I can put it in a, in a bath of viscous fluid, and I can just try and determine how it behaves. And through some rather complex and subtle process, I eventually am able, able to determine that it has an, a, an even number of total degrees of freedom, but I don't yet know in necessarily what I should think of as configuration and what I should think of as velocity. So crudely speaking, you know, Newton's second law, this is not perhaps the standard way of writing it, but I claim that under some very, very mild technical assumptions, this is uh, I mean, uh, basically, unless uh, I'm not even going to get into it. This is basically mathematically equivalent to the normal way of writing Newton's, Newton's second law. I've just written it as two, as two coupled ordinary differential equations. X dot equals V, V dot equals zero. And this is Newton's second law for a free particle experiencing no force. I'm not going to worry about um, the, uh, the coefficient of proportionality, the inertial mass. Just if you like, set it equal to one. doesn't matter. But if you, if you think of these if I have somehow or other determined that on my space of states that I, I've determined some physical quantities that it's useful to uh, parameterize the space of states uh, based, on those, based on the values of those quantities, and I figure out how the particle or the system behaves when in some way or other I've determined it's not interacting with this environment, 
then I can draw the integral curves on the space of, st I can draw the paths on the space of states that represent its dynamical evolutions. I can figure out what the vector fields are everywhere tangent to those paths. And it turns out for a free system, the dynamical vector field in these, in these coordinates, in the X and V coordinates, always has these components. Now let's say I hit my system with a stick. Well, it turns out the, the equation of motion of X doesn't change. X dot always equals V. Nothing I, nothing I can do to the system changes that. But the equation of motion for V does change. It just equals this, the force that I've impressed on the system. So the, the dynamical vector field is always of this form. Instead of V zero, it's V some uh, quantity that, it, that I will call the force. And the interaction vector field, the vector field that, I ha that represents the, the imposition of the force moving from free system to system interacting with environment is always of this form. It always has zero for the, uh, for the X dot components and it always has some quantity, some force for the V dot components. So it's easy to see, I'm, I, I'm, I'm not giving you mathematical proofs of these statements. If you're, uh, you can look at my papers if you like, this can all be made precise but I'm just speaking very loosely here, uh, just to give you an intuitive picture. The dynamical evolution represented by the vector field, a dynamical evolution is always represented by a vector field that always has V for the component of the DDX part. Whoops. Right there. The interaction represented by, uh, represented by a vector field always has zero for the component of the DX part. It points only in velocital directions. It's an instantaneous acceleration, if you like. It's an instantaneous change in velocity, not in position. Any magnitude of force in any direction can be applied to any system in principle. I can hit it with as big a stick as I want to, as hard as I want to, in any direction I want to. And I can hit it with two sticks at once in different directions with different magnitudes. And it turns out that doing so, the applied force is always summed vectorially. So it turns out that, in fact, one can completely characterize a, phys a classical system by, ha by with the following structures: the space of states is an e the space of states is an even dimensional manifold. The family of interaction vector fields has the structure of a vector space, whose integral curves, in fact, determine a family of disjoint submanifolds of the of the space of states, each of which is half the dimension of the space of states and they jointly foliate the space of states. Between you and me, secretly behind the scenes, the space of states is the tangent bundle of configuration space and these submanifolds are the fibers of the, of the tangent bundle. And you have to add a few more technical conditions to make it all work, but those aren't interesting for our purposes. And the family of dynamical vector fields has the structure of an affine space modeled on this vector space of interaction vector fields. So again, I, if I add any two vector fields of this form, I get another vector field of this form. Adding two interactions gives me a new interaction. If I subtract any vector field of this form from another vector field of this form, I get exactly this, uh, a vector field of the interaction form. So interaction vector, interactions are exactly what take you from one dynamical evolution to another. You can't add two dynamical evolutions, that makes no physical sense. But you can't always subtract them to tell, to let you, to tell you what the interaction is that, that moves you from one to the other. So I basically set, uh, set, all, uh, set all this already, but just to repeat, it's worth repeating. If I can hit a particle with two sticks, I can hit it with both at the same time. Interactions form a vector space. The difference between any two evolutions is just the force I need to apply to one to get to the other. And this is now where um, something really, truly remarkable happens. Because, I've dis because of the algebraic structure of these two families of vector fields, the fact that, this is, that this, these vector fields form a vector space, and this forms an affine uh, space modeled on this vector space, this actually gives me a way to say what, what quantities are configuration and what quantities are velocity. If two points of the space of states are connected by an integral curve of an interaction vector field, then those states have the same configuration. 
because remember, configure, interaction vector fields only point in, in, chain, in instantaneous change of velocity directions. They don't, they, don't, uh, they don't point in instantaneous change of configuration directions. And so a quantity is a configuration quantity if and only if it's constant on all the corresponding submanifolds of S that the, pat, that the, or, that the integral curves of the, of the interaction vector fields determine. And then it turns out you get for free, there is a unique dynamical vector field um, in, that is distinguished by the fact that only configuration quantities change. That's the free, that's the free vector field. So conceptually, the family of possible interactions allows one to distinguish cons configuration from velocity in a completely principled way that follows just from the intrinsic structure of the dynamics. So interactions directly modify the system's evolution only in velocidal directions, as generalized acceleration. And in fact, velocity, velocity quantities are always dynamical der uh, derivatives of configuration, of configuration uh, quantities. Uh, der uh, dynamical derivatives in the sense of the affine structure on, that, on the family of dynamical vector fields. And so this actually tells us the physical meaning of configuration. The configuration of a system in, uh, encodes what the possible interactions it, with its environment are. So it turns out then that, so everything I've said has more or less been, I, I've only relied on the, on the algebraic structures imposed on evolutions and interactions from Newton's second law. But it turns out this gives you enough, enough structure to completely reconstruct Lagrangian mechanics. So given a classical system, as I've defined it, with the space, with the even dimensional uh, space, with the space of states S and even dimensional manifold, and the families of vector fields D and I that have the appropriate algebraic um, and geometric structures that relate to each other in the way that I, that I, I, I sketched, one can reconstruct the system's configuration space from the algebraic structure of the interactions. It turns out that there is, in fact, then a canonical isomorphism of the space of states to the tangent bundle of configuration space. One uses the distinguished free dynamical vector field to lift, um, basic, to, to define the isomorphism, basically. The family of dynamical vector fields is then, in fact, isomorphic to the family of vector fields on the tangent bundle of configuration space that represents all solutions to, to the Euler-Grange equation. Uh, there, a, solution, a vector field on the, on the tangent bundle of configuration space is a solution to the Euler-Lagrange equation if and only if it's a lift of a vector field on configuration space to the tangent bundle of configuration space. So you take a, a path on configuration space that defines, a that defines a vector field on configuration space, a point, but a point and a, a vector on configuration space defines a point on the tangent bundle. So you can naturally lift these curves on configuration space to curves on the tangent bundle. That curve then defines a vector field on the tangent bundle, the tangent bundle, the tangent bundle of configuration space. And, though, and those vector fields are, those and only those are solutions to the Euler-Lagrange equation. It's not difficult to show. And it turns out that under, this, that under the isomorphism that's induced by the free dynamical vector field between the, the abstractly characterized space of states and the tangent bundle to the constructed configuration space, the family of dynamical vector fields is just, is just the family of possible solutions to the Lagrange equation. And the interaction vector fields, as one should expect, is isomorphic to the family of vector fields on the tangent bundle of configuration space that represent generalized forces. They're the vertical vector fields, the one pointing straight up and down the fibers of the tangent bundle of configuration space. In particular, on the tangent bundle, the vertical vector fields have the structure of a vector space, and the second order vector fields, the solutions to the Lagrange equation, have the structure of an affine space modeled on the vector space of, ve of uh, vertical vector fields. So there's a, a, a very strong sense in which Lagrangian mechanics just is Newton's second law. Lagrangian mechanics has all and only the structure that you get already from Newton's second law. The Grandin mechanics is just as classical as it can possibly be. Just uh, 
for possible interest, um, there's a converse to the theorem. If I give you an even dimensional, man if I, well actually I don't have to uh, specify it's even dimensional. If I give you a manifold that admits a formulation of the Euler-Grange equation in the sense of having an operator mapping scalar fields to a family of vector fields D having the appropriate structure, geometrically you say it's an integral complete almost tangent structure, don't worry about that unless we want to talk about it later and I can tell you what that means. The, Everyone, uh, everyone always gets really excited about symplectic geometry, you know, the intrinsic geometry of the cotangent bundle. But the tangent bundle actually has its own intrinsic geometry, which is very, very beautiful. And it's essentially the intrinsic ge geometry of the, of the Euler-Grange equation. And no one ever talks about it for some reason, but it, it's really nice. Every, everyone should think, everyone should learn that besides symplectic geometry. So it turns out that if such an operator exists, then you, can, then you can show this manifold is diffeomorphic to a tangent bundle. The operator allows one to construct configuration space and to construct a canonical isomorphism between the original manifold and the tangent bundle of configuration space that takes the, the family D that are, that are the solutions to the, that are the targets of the Euler-Grange operator. And in particular, D is the family of dynamical vector fields turns out to be an affine space modeled on the vector space of vector fields on the original manifold that map to the vertical vector fields on the tangent bundle of configuration space. So it really is the case that classical mechanics just is Lagrangian mechanics. And it's, it's interesting um, also to, um, to pause just for a moment and think about some of the differences between Lagrangian mechanics now and Hamiltonian mechanics. Lagrangian mechanics is incredibly rigid in a way that Hamiltonian mechanics is not. I can do Hamiltonian mechanics on any symplectic manifold. It doesn't have to be a, uh, the cotangent bundle of another space. You give me an even dimensional orientable manifold, it automatically has a symplectic structure. I can write down Hamilton's equations on it and go to town. If I am, a, if, if you give me a manifold and you're able to def appropriately define a global operator on it that satisfies the conditions of, uh, for, that I claim capture the idea of representing solutions to the, to the Lagrange equation. That rigidly fixes the manifold as a tangent bundle of, of a configuration space. You, simple, ham you know, Hamiltonian mechanics you can do on any symplectic manifold. Lagrangian mechanics you must do on a tangent bundle. It's very rigid. So just to sum up, Lagrangian mechanics, classical mechanics, defines and enforces, it defines configuration velo and velocity and enforces the difference between them. It defines the kinematical relation between them. The latter, the velocities are always the, kinema always the dynamical derivatives of the former. If you're curious, this is the, mathemat this is the geometrical representation of, of that claim where uh, the J is the canonical almost tangent structure on the tangent bundle. This is the geometrized, generalized version of X dot equals V. One half, I'm sorry. Oh, I, th I thought I, I heard someone asking a question. I'm just, I'm, I'm auditorily hallucinating, I guess. Um, I knew I shouldn't have had that second dose of acid. Okay. Uh, so a, no a notion of interaction um, one automatically gets a notion of interaction that's distinct from the dynamical evolutions and one automatically gets a distinguished notion of isolation. Okay. So if I know only the space of states, uh, that wasn't exactly where I expected it to be. If I know only the space of states as an abstract manifold and how to solve the Euler-Grange equation or Newton's second law, I can reconstruct everything else. The dynamics by itself, intrinsically and automatically, def defines and encodes everything that I've talked about. And that's what I mean by a classical system, that there is this mathematical and conceptual distinction between configuration and velocity that's encoded in the dynamics, that this evolution, that this conceptual distinction itself encodes the difference between configuration and velocity and one gets naturally distinguished free evolution. I know I'm repeating myself here, but these are real, I, but since I just worked through a bunch of, of rather heavy duty technical, technical machinery without really explaining it, I really wanna make sure at least that the high level conceptual lessons are imparted. Hey, mm -hmm. 
please. If you, yeah. So in um, in order, if if you let let's say let's say in fact let let's do the hardest possible case for me, or a, a hard possible case. Let's say that you know, you give me uh, what? I always forget this. It's right. It's good. It's a k minus u right. Okay. So it's you give me the Lagrangian for a simple harmonic oscillator. And I don't tell you, but you don't know which, is, which are the V's and which are the X's. I claim if, I, if you tell me how to solve the Euler-Lagrange equation, I can tell you which are the V's and which are the X's. What is their coupling? What is their, what is their tool? So, is yeah, so, um, if, so if, if you have, let's say, you know, t uh, two, pendul uh, two pendulums connected by a spring, yeah, yeah it, um, it, wor it works. It, as on, as on as long as, you t as long as I know how to solve the Euler-Lagrange equation, I can, w without you telling me beforehand which, which quantities are velocity and which quantities are configuration, I, I, I can work just if you, if I know how to solve the Euler-Lagrange equation, I can tell you that. And so if they are coupled, mm -hmm. you could be able to tell me, oh, they are coupled, and this is how it would behave if the mm -hmm. zero one is in this. Well, so it, de it depends on how you treat them. It, um, it, if you treat one as a system and the other as an, imp as an externally imposed intervention, no. If you treat both as a system, then I may not I may not be able to tell I, I may not be able to tell you um, how they operate when they're not when they're not coupled like that. But I will be able to tell you for the joint system what the configurations and the velocities are. Um, because let's say that what's surprising here, at least to me. So let, let's say that I have, in fact, some system like a like a harmonic oscillator, and this this is now the space of states. And somehow or other, I um, I figured out some way to parameterize the the states of the system using um, using physical quantities that that I can measure. But I don't yet know I don't I don't know yet know which ones I should think of as velocity and which ones I should think of as configuration. A good example is, um, is a Maxwell field. In the standard Lagrangian uh, framework, you treat uh, the magnetic field as configuration and you treat the electric field as velocity. That is utterly opaque to me and mysterious. This actually explains wh why. I, uh, so I'll, I, 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 I can show you in a minute. So, but, but all I know is that I, I parameterized by my space of states by two quantities that I will suggestively call x and v. And by starting, by starting the system with different initial conditions and hitting it with different sticks you know, a, as I go, I'm able to determine that these, are, that these paths are the possible dynamical evolutions. These define, you know, these define the dynamical what I call the dynamical vector fields. Yeah, I do, I, I do shitloads of experiments. You know, I, just, I, I just set up the system. So we assume that the theory is completely solved. Um, yeah, exactly. But 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 I don't know what's configuration and what's velocity. If I. Well, yeah, I know, but I, I'm looking at things. I'm looking at things backwards. I'm a, I'm asking if all I know is the dynamics in this very abstract way, can that tell me what what configuration and velocity are? And it turns out. Remarkably, that if this is all I know, I can, at least for the classical case. I think actually, did I include? I did. So it turns out that even though Maxwell fields aren't Newtonian, they actually have the same structure. And I, this explains why you always treat B as configuration and E as velocity in a Lagrangian formulation. 
because for a free max, the in, in natural in natural coordinates, so to speak, the components of the dynamical vector field for a free Maxwell field are just this. There's always zero in the in the div b column. There's always uh, minus curl e in the b dot column. There's zero in the div e column, and there's uh, curl b in the e dot column. What it, turning on an interaction for Maxwell fields? The only thing I can mean is throwing in some electric charges and moving them around. So that equation doesn't change. That equation doesn't change. The only, thing, the only thing that changes are these two equations. So this is exactly like a, a v equals x dot, and this is exactly like v dot equals f. And this, uh, in this case. Then um, the Maxwell field would not have this structure. So, would just have to yeah. So that if, if if magnetic monopoles existed, then it would not be the case that the dynamical vector fields. So the, uh, the, you would, the interaction vector fields would not, be an, would not be a vector space. Well, they would be a vector space, but the dynamical vector fields would not be an affine space modeled on that vector space. And I wouldn't be able to, tell, I wouldn't be able to give you a principled reason why I should treat the, the magnetic field as configuration and the electric field as velocity in the Lagrangian formulation. The only reason I can do that is because there are not magnetic monopoles. So can you deal with the same question? Mm -hmm. No, 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 this is, no, please. In this, in this case, yeah. Something it's external it's systems. No, uh, no, no I, uh, I just meant by, oh, I, I, by source, I thought you meant um, a, a electrical charge and, and current. But no, speaking very, very generally, yes. The, 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 the configuration quantities are those that don't change instantaneously when I turn on an interaction. That's right. Exactly. No. So if no, in fact, in fact, if I if if I if I know the if I know all the dynamical vector fields, if I'm able to, to convince myself that I have probed the system and, ex and examined the system enough that I have exhaustively figured out what all the dynamical vector fields are, that does allow me to reconstruct the interactions, because ah, yeah, at least if it's a classical system. Because the dynamical vector fields are an affine space modeled on a vector space, and that vector space is exactly the vector space of interactions. So if, if it's a classical system, all the dynamical vector fields will have the structure of an affine space, and, that, and the vector space that's modeled on will exactly be the interactions. So yeah. So. And what I mean when I say that there's always a clean separation between a system's degrees of freedom and those of its environment is that no matter the interaction, I can determine the system's evolution without knowing any details whatsoever about the environment's degrees of freedom or the evolution. Because I just black box the environment and it's all, all the relevant information is just encoded in the interaction vector field. The interaction vector field is, li it lives on the, space, on the system's space of states. It's represented uh, in the terms of the system's own quantities, I don't, I don't need to know anything about the environment in order to understand the dynamics and the interactions. Sorry. Mm -hmm. No, please. No, um, uh, this, is so, this is something more, because in, uh, it, in, in Lagrangian mechanics, of course, the, um, you can write the, the homogeneous 
uh, Euler-Lagrange equation can include uh, can include it includes solutions that are far larger than the um, than the than the free evolution. So, I I, I, it, it, I can the the, inhom the inhomogeneous Euler-Lagrange equation includes um, you, you need to you need to put a work one form on the right hand side, and if and that is not reducible to the homogeneous one if the work one form is not conservative. If uh, the the work one form, so the, the generalized force you write on the right hand side of the Euler Bond yeah. equation, yeah. What I'm saying is, it's sort of put the force to zero, mm -hmm. that's homogeneous mm -hmm. theory, and that's what people call your free evolution. Um, well, it's in I guess in some sense, except that for the for the very for the you know for the if I have. Uh, you know, this, that's the free evolution of the simple harmonic oscillator. Yeah. But if I, but I can also do this, um, I can couple it this, uh, to some dis to some dissipative uh, to, uh, to, to some dissipative mechanism, and I would. The way that I think about, I guess there are many, you can think about this in different ways, but the way that I think about this is it's the same system. I'm just, I've just now, I've just now coupled it to an external, to something in the environment that's, that's dissipative. I guess if, if you like, you can think of these as two different physical systems. But the way that I think about it is they're the same physical system. I've just hooked this up to an interaction with the environment. Yes. Um, so, 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 so the, the, yeah. 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 And that, 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 that's exactly how I'm using these terms. That's free evolution of the, of the, of the system. That's okay. evolution coupled to an external force. Um, that again, um, I, I is so. What's more is that in order to uh, d in order to do what you just described, set external force to zero, you need you need to already know what the what, what the different quantities are, how they're classified, and you need to know how to f to formulate the Euler-Lagrange equation. And what I what I'm 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 working from the kind of opposite direction. I don't know what the quantities are. I don't know. What the what the what the form of the equation is, I just know how I just know how to draw paths on space of states that rep I know how to parameterize space of states with some set of quantities, and I know how to draw paths on it that represent possible dynamical evolutions. What can I get from that? And what I can get from that is a complete re for classical systems is a complete reconstruction of everything that we or that we know and love. So, can I just oh, please, yes. Uh, I think it's related to your um, mm -hmm. topic, harmonic oscillator, but I, when you were discussing it, I mm -hmm. was thinking about something else. So maybe I'll repeat myself mm -hmm. and then we mm -hmm. postpone for after the talk. So, when I think about the coupled harmonic oscillator, mm -hmm. then um, I can, uh, uh, I, I wonder whether one can define the whole system as a free mm -hmm. system because I don't have an external force. Mm -hmm. Right. You can you can you can do it either way, is the answer. And um, and if you if you do it the first way, where you treat the coupled harmonic oscillator as a single system, then um, and and you, you allow me then to hit it with sticks and dip it in viscous fluids and figure out how you know, how how it moves under all under all these external inter interventions, then I can do, I can do the do this full reconstruction in the way that I've sketched for that system. Alternatively, I can treat one of them as my system, and I can treat the other one as a, as one possible 
intervention of the, of the environment. So in the interest of time, um, I will not uh, sketch, I, I will not give you the sketch of how it is that you can actually reconstruct the entirety of, uh, of uh, the geometry of four-dimensional Newtonian space-time from everything I've just discussed. If you're curious, uh, may maybe we can talk about it over beers or coffee or something, and I, I can sketch it for you. It's actually pretty, I think it's pretty cool. But it turns out that you actually can reconstruct the entire geometry of, of, of four-dimensional Newtonian space Newtonian space-time from the structures and constructions that I've shown you. So if you know the dynamics, you not only know the configuration and momentum, uh, the configuration and velocity quantities of an arbitrary system that you're studying, you, uh, you also know how the dynamics is embedded in the background space-time. That is rigidly and concretely fixed. So the theorem is the Euclidean geometry of ordinary space, the metrical structure of time, and the flat affine geometry of four-dimensional Newtonian space-time is entirely determined by the dynamical structure of a classical system. So let's quickly um, cover Hamiltonian mechanics. So as I remarked earlier, phase space is a symplectic manifold. The family of dynamical vector fields is a Lie algebra formed by solving Hamilton's equation for all Hamiltonians. The only fixed relations between the Q's and the P's are the canonical Poisson brackets. The only thing one can mean by interaction here is just adding another Hamiltonian. But that means that there is no distinction between interactions and evolutions. The vector fields that, rep that represent evolutions and the vector fields that represent interactions are the same family of vector fields. So if I just give you an even dimensional manifold and I tell you how to solve Hamilton's equation on it, but I don't tell you anything else, you cannot tell me what the Q's and what the P's are. You cannot reconstruct uh, the difference between configuration and momentum based just on those structures because the dynamical, instead of the family of dynamical vector fields having the structure of, a, of, a vec of an affine space modeled on the separate family of, of interaction vector fields, which is a, a, a vector space, we now have that the, that, that the dynamical vector fields and the interaction vector fields are both are the same, and they're a Lie algebra. Sorry, mm -hmm. why can't you just say, OK, I, I look if I add one another component mm -hmm. and see if there is any change of my, of, mm -hmm. of my and mm -hmm. um, So the, do you do that? So, the, there, will, there will be a very special subset of Hamiltonians for which you can do that. Yeah. And, but, as, as I'll discuss in a moment. Um, so, no, but that, that, that's exactly the right question to ask. So the closest, the closest theorem that I could come up with that captures something like the flavor of the, of the reconstruction theorem for Lagrangian mechanics is the following. Fix an even dimensional orientable manifold with a Poisson bracket structure and a vector space of vector fields on it. Then the Poisson bracket arises from a symplectic structure and the vector space includes all and only solutions to Hamilton's equation formulated with it. If and only if the vector fields span the tangent planes, i.e. at every point of the manifold, um, all the tangent plane is spanned by, by some set of elements from the, all the vector fields at that point. The manifold has a family of coordinate systems whose coordinate functions satisfy the canonical Poisson bracket relations. The associated coordinate vector fields leave the vector space invariant under the action of the Lie bracket, and the vector space is maximal under these properties. It doesn't tell you anything about the distinction between the different quantities or about any further, any way to decompose uh, phase space. And if you think about it, this, should, this shouldn't be terribly surprising precisely because you can do Hamiltonian mechanics on any symplectic manifold. It doesn't have to be the cotangent bundle of a configuration space. So if you were able to distinguish configuration from momentum just by the dynamics of, 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 Hamilton's mechanic, of Hamiltonian mechanics alone, that would be surprising since, generally speaking, Hamil Hamilton's equation can be formulated on any symplectic manifold, not one where there's a natural, already a natural distinction between Q's and P's. 
So Hamiltonian mechanics is not a classical framework in this sense. The families of evolution and interaction vector fields are identical, having the structure of a Lie algebra. Interaction just is adding another Hamiltonian. There's no principal distinction between configuration and momentum. That's, that's intrinsic to the dynamics itself. In particular, the latter is not the dynamical derivative of the former, at least not in any asymmetric sense. They're, they're fixed relations. The canonical Poisson bracket relations are completely symmetric. And there's no naturally distinguished free evolution vector field. The zero vector field isn't a good candidate. It's too degenerate. One wants to allow constant changes to configuration for free evolution. But if I don't know what configuration is, I have no idea what that means. Now, to sum up, I mean, if, if I fix what's configuration and what's momentum, by fiat, by divine revelation, and somehow or other, I, 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 I just, you know, my, by a, an act of, of, of Fichtean you know, intellectual intuition, I just grasp the ding on Zeke and know what the configuration and momentum quantities are. Then there is a clean separation between systems degrees of freedom and those of its environment. I can completely ignore details of the environment's degrees of freedom, treat it as a black box, and everything relevant is just encoded in the interaction Hamiltonian which is uh, written, which is expressed using the system zone quantities. So I can black box the environment, don't need to know anything about it, and I can still represent, I can still represent interactions. Now, this now, uh, this now addresses your, your question, Chaslov. So why then does Hamiltonian mechanics work so well to model classical systems? Because by fiat, we identify some variables as momentum, and this is the really important part. We restrict attention only to Hamiltonians having a special form, those that are purely quadratic in the momentum. This reproduces, for this very special class of Hamiltonians, this reproduces the fixed kinematical relations between configuration and velocity in classical systems. For this very special class of Hamiltonians, we can do what you suggested. But there's nothing intrinsic to Hamiltonian mechanics that says I can only ever have a Hamiltonian that's quadratic and it's purely quadratic and momentum. Um, you know, if, if you think about the equivalent, if, if you try and do the same thing here, if you try and, and quote unquote, cup, you know, couple a harmonic oscillator to a dissipative system, uh, to a dissipative mechanism in Hamiltonian mechanics, you're going to get, you, not only will you not get V equals Q dot, which is, you know, the, the classical kinematical relation, you'll get V dot equals V equals Q dot plus one. I have no idea what that means. I mean, the, the short answer is that at least, physic, at least with regard to classical systems, if you want to use Hamiltonian mechanics, you have to, by fiat, restrict yourself to the special class of Hamiltonians that reproduce the classical structure that I, that I spelled out. So, it's a, Hamiltonian mechanics is an odd, I think, no man's land that shares features of both classical and quantum mechanics. There's no mathematical or conceptual distinction between interaction and evolution, but there still is a clean separation of the system's degrees of freedom from those of the environment in the precise sense that I can turn on an interaction in scare quotes because I don't yet know really what the difference between interaction and evolution is while treating the environment as a black box. Um, what just happened? I think my battery just died. What a bummer. No, because this, this is also off. Oh. And anyone have a charger that works for this Mac? And do we have a, yes, the battery definitely died. So I can basically continue talking without the slides, because I basically know what I want to say. 
but uh, if that's okay, if that's okay with you all, um, I, I can keep on talking because I I know what I want to say, but um, it might it might be easier to follow with this with with the slides. Should I wait for the slides or should I keep on going? Okay. Sorry about that. Perfect. Thank you so much. Okay. I, I will wrap up very quickly. Ah, there we go. It's slowly coming back to life. It's like me after a nap. Good. Okay. So, in the interest of time, let's let's skip over that. Okay. I can now do quantum mechanics very very quickly because things are basically the same except with one really important change. Dynamical vector fields are just unitary flows on the Hilbert space. Unitary flows are exponentiated Hamiltonian self-adjoint operators. Interaction again is just adding another Hamiltonian, and the only fixed relation between configuration and momentum is the canonical commutation relation, which Q and P enter in a conceptual sense symmetrically, although of course this is an anti-symmetric you know, structure, but when I say, when I say uh, symmetrically, I mean this doesn't, this doesn't allow you to distinguish the Q's and the P's by itself. So if I give you a Hilbert space and its family of self-adjoint operators, the dynamics, you can't distinguish interactions from, from evolutions, you can't tell me what's configuration and what's momentum, you can't tell what's free evolution, and even if I give you a standard Hamiltonian, let's say you know, I'm, I'm dealing with, a, free, I'm dealing with a, a particle, and I give you the, 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 the standard free Hamiltonian for that particle, but I give it to you in some really funky basis, you will not be able to tell me, just based on the dynamics alone, what, is, what, what the P's and the Q's are. And if, I, and if I give it to you, if I give you the, the Hamiltonian for the particle engaged in some interaction, you know, in some say harmonic, you know, in some harmonic potential, but again, in some funky basis, you won't be able to tell me what the free part and what the interaction part is, if all you know is the structure of the, of the dynamics. So you need to have an explicit representation, both of the degrees of freedom of the environment and their intertwining with those of the system in order to appropriately and adequately treat the system during an interaction. More specifically, I need to change the space of states in a way that I didn't need to in, class, in classical mechanics, because that now, I need to, now I need to use the tensor product of the isolated Hilbert space with that of the environment. I need to change the set of physical quantities that I use to treat the system. Now, they're, now I use the algebra of observables on the tensor product Hilbert space, not the original Hilbert space. And I need to change the structure of the quantities encoding evolution, because now they're Hamiltonians on the tensor product space. So in order, not only can I not not only does the dynamics by itself, the intrinsic structure of the dynamics by itself, not tell me how to distinguish interaction from evolution, if I even want to think about evolution, I mean, if I even want to think about interaction, I need to completely change e every structure I use to treat the system. So this is, this I take it, is what's really most characteristic of quantum mechanics, the most characteristic difference between quantum systems and classical systems like uh, Bo uh, Bob's, to echo Bob's very uh, programmatic remark that it's, it's the notion of compositionality and entanglement that's the most characteristic of quantum systems. This, I take it, is one way to try and make a little more, that idea a little more precise. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. One is still within the Hamiltonian, mm -hmm. uh, uh, but 
this picture you find in the morning where there are substances mm -hmm. in vitro, mm -hmm. then you have maybe three viral vaccines, mm -hmm. or you have external fashion, which, mm -hmm. which is still a closed system, mm -hmm. and you maybe not preserved, but it's closed in the sense mm -hmm. that you don't need to treat any other degree of freedom, it's just mm -hmm. human uh, mm -hmm. evolution. The other one is when the system is open, mm -hmm. and So, uh, so, I, so I, I, I'm sorry. I, I wasn't quite clear on um, on the on the on what you were talking about. Were you talking about classical the classical Hamiltonian framework, or are you talking about the the quantum framework I, I using Hamiltonians? Yes. Previously in classical. In the classical case, everything was encoded in the uh, in Hamiltonian. Right. And I can put this as well in quantum mechanics. I can mm -hmm. have some mm -hmm. interventions in mm -hmm. the Hamiltonian, um, but still it's uh, uh, sufficient to uh, preserve uh, all information mm -hmm. in, in one system without flow, flowing information in the environment. The other mm -hmm. thing is if you want to go beyond that, but then you have to do it both in classical. Mm -hmm. No, I, so I don't. I don't think I agree because if, if I understand the point you're making, because the uh, in for a classical system, if I just you know, black, black box the environment and and stick all of the interaction in the Hamiltonian or the Lagrangian using only the the, the quantities of the, the system's own quantities to, re to represent the interaction, then as long as uh, then I, I can represent every single fact. I can represent every single fact about the relationship between the system and its environment using the system's own quantities. I don't see any reason why that why that's different. It's not system. Yeah, no, but no, no, but it's a Lagrangian system. Uh, but but there are I mean there, there there are many differences between Lagrangian and Hamiltonian mechanics. One of which is you can't treat dissipative systems in Hamiltonian mechanics. But at least, but at least classically, if I, if I'm if I'm allowed to treat the system in, in the framework, then I then I can using the system's own degrees of freedom and only the system's degrees of freedom, I can tell you everything there is about an, inter an interaction with the environment and the system. But it but if I in quantum mechanics, um, if there's in, if there's entanglement, then I then I, I cannot tell you everything about the, sy the system's evolution without also knowing about the environment's evolution. And that, th that I take it is the, is the distinction between the classical and the, and the quantum treat, uh, treatment or idea of interaction. But it d I, I'm not sure if that addresses what you're saying. Yeah, I have to think about the Because in, 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 in the story it's, again, non-deterministic evolution. Mm -hmm. Yes. You see that you can end up with the same point, although you start with a different one. Right. So that means like it's not sufficient to completely determine. But, uh, right, but in the ground in the ground mechanics it is. It is. Yes. So that uh, so there's a so that 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 is exactly where I want to go. I want to say that that ex precisely because the in quantum mechanics the distinct the distinction you draw between the system and the environment precisely because of this fact is somewhat is arbitrary. No, I'm treating the environment as quantum. 
So what I'm uh, so I want to say that at, at the end of, at the end of the day, the, the lesson I want to draw from all this is that uh, there is no real distinction between system and environment in quantum mechanics, not the way there is in classical mechanics. Why is there a distinction? Because I be, be, precisely because I can completely characterize the dynamics of the system um, and not e including interactions without knowing anything about the environment. So in Hamiltonian mechanics, it's, it's, not, it's not always clear. In Lagrangian mechanics, it's always clear. Well, if I want to call one of them the system and the other the environment, what's the system? Um, you, can, you, can always change, you can always change your definition, but what, 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 once, once you fixed, but uh, once you fixed what, once you fixed what your system is, then you can treat the system completely, thoroughly, comprehensively without knowing anything about the environment. That is not true in quantum mechanics. Even if I fix my system, I can't treat it comprehensively, thoroughly, irrespective of any interaction with everything else, unless I, uh, unless I actually know some stuff about everything else. In Lagrangian, in, in, in Lagrangian treatment, mm -hmm. yeah, exactly. So in Lagra in, for classical systems, by which I really mean Newtonian and Lagrangian mechanics, I can I, I can treat the dynamics, once I've, once I've figured out what the system is, once I've decided on that, I don't need to know anything about the environment in order to characterize inter interactions and the dynamics under interactions. That's not true for, that's mostly not true for Hamiltonian mechanics and not true at all for quantum mechanics. Okay, so you're going somewhere to say that uh, if you uh, request the quantum treatment between whatever is given a position in the environment, I th yeah, I think. So quantum field theory is significantly more difficult to deal with in uh, in this, um, y using the ideas that I'm working with. I, in fact, have not. So I, w um, I once. Uh, Think of the Schrodinger yeah. equation mm -hmm. about a potential right. term across the tree, mm -hmm. and then ask the gravitational force whether mm -hmm. it's one of them. I mean, uh, still the same story, right? You treat the same experiment both in the Well, so uh, again, if you. The, 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 game, the game I'm playing here is I'm, I'm asking how much can I reconstruct about, if all I know is how the system evolves in time, and, and all I know is in some sense how, how, it couple, how it can couple the environment and how that changes how it evolves in time. What can I reconstruct about the system if that's all, if that's all I know? And the claim is that in classical mechanics I can reconstruct everything about the system without knowing any details about the environment. And the claim is that in quantum mechanics, if I know the same thing, so I, I so for instance, I, I don't know. I'm not assuming from the start that I know how to write down a Hamiltonian in any particular form. All I know is that the system can evolve by unitary flows on the Hilbert space. And now I and now I ask you, Marios, which which of those unitary flows is the free one? And if all you know are the unitary flows, you can't tell me that. In classical mechanics, yes. Uh, because in classical mechanics, the difference between the, the mathematical uh, the mathematical relationships, the fact that the, that the that the evolutions and the interactions are are represented by different vector fields, which have a ver which have this very intimate algebraic relationship between them, allows me to uh, to say what configuration is and what velocity is, and then the free vector field, the free the, and the, then the free dynamical evolution is that unique vector field in which only configuration quantities change. But, and that, and that, you, that is a construction that's not available in quantum mechanics. So there's a sense in which if I just give you the unitary flows, you don't, you don't really know anything. In classical mechanics, if I give you the dynamical vector fields, you know everything.
but you don't like the conceptual picture behind it. Okay. So how do we distinguish the Q's and the P's then in quantum mechanics? And so to find free evolution, well, we do it in one of two ways. We just do it by fiat. We just say, we just have the algebra and we just say those are the Q's and those are the P's. Or else we introduce a representation, say the Poincaré or the Galilean group, a la Wigner, and define Q as the generator of momentum translations and so on. In both cases, however, we must explicitly and by hand hook the dynamics up to the background space-time structure to get a principal distinction between configuration and momentum and so define free and interacting. We don't get it from the dynamics alone for free as in classical mechanics. So wild speculation, not really, part, not really relevant at this talk, but I thought I'd throw it in there anyway. Perhaps the lesson is that there's no bottom, no real difference between Q and P in quantum mechanics and so quantum gravity shouldn't be formulated in a three plus one framework. This really irritated Carlo when I, when he saw this. But I, I actually, ha I think I actually put this slide in there. Because, I mean, uh, why, why do you say three plus one? Um, well, uh, because three, three plus one, in order, to, uh, in order to distinguish three plus one, in order to, uh, to write down GR in a three plus one formulation, I have to know what the space like and what the time like directions are. Which are encoded, which are the Q's and the P's. Please. So, in, um, so yeah, that's an ex that's an excellent question. And in fact, if under the, um, in a standard in a standard sense, um, say uh, uh, of a constrained Hamiltonian system, the way that like uh, Dirac set it up, that does give you enough information to reconstruct everything, precisely because the constraints. Um, in order to write down some meaningful constraints, you already have to know what the distinct wh which are the Q's and which are the P's. But I, I, actually I actually thought about this a while ago and never actually got around to sitting down and trying to prove it. But I think that, the, but I conjecture that there is a sense in which if you tell me what the sensible constraint, if you tell me what the sensible ways of constraining the system are without telling me what the Q's and the P's are, I think I can reconstruct what the Q's and the P's are just from that. But that's a conjecture, I have not, prov I have not proved that. So, now, indefinite causal orders. Uh, <laughs> I, will, I will very quickly, I already drew the pictures. I will very quickly just tell you um, what, what the thoughts are. So if, if you accept what I'm saying and the dynamics of a quantum system does not intrinsically fix what the Q's and the P's are, but you have to hook it up by hand to the background uh, space-time structure, I have to uh, put the sponge in between. Ah. I'm a theoretician, I'm not an engineer. You know, I'm, not an exp I'm not an experimentalist. Um, these devices are too com complicated for me. So an indefinite causal order on a, a let, let's say that we have a, um, a fixed background space time so let's just, let's just do Minkowski space time. We have, you know, the, it, it's, char it's characterized in large part, forgetting, forgetting, about the forgetting about the volume element, it's almost entirely characterized by the null cone structure. And so one way to think about an indefinite causal structure, there are, in, in, there are two specific types of indefinite causal structure that I think we might, I might be able to get a grip on. So if I know the Q's and the P's, let's say um, because I have a representation of the Poincaré group, that allows me to reconstruct the null cones. And to change the null cones, so a, a different causal order on the same space time, let's say one way of thinking about it, one possible way to change the causal order is just to tilt the null cones. 
that represents a different a different cause, a different uh, possible causal structure. I'm not I'm not widening them. I'm not I'm not twisting them. I'm not you know de deforming them. So I'm just take I'm just taking one Minkowski space time and rotating it into another Minkowski space time. But I'm keeping the I'm, I'm keeping R four itself fixed. I'm keeping all the, all the vectors the same, so to speak. So if this is a time-like vector, I mean, I'm sorry, let's do this. If that's a time-like vector there, then if I rotate the null cones, it's now a space-like vector. So one way to, one way to, the, the, if I, a natural mathematical operation that uh, induces this kind of rotation is an element of SO4. Because I remember, I'm not. I, um, I, it, it can't be SO31 because I, I don't want. I don't want to respect um, the Lorentz the, the Minkowski geometry. I want to change the Minkowski geometry. And another another possible way to think about a change of causal order is to if I very slightly widen the null cones at every point. And a natural way to represent that is and that, that, that actually will take me from one Minkowski metric to a, new, to a new Minkowski metric if I do it by defining my new metric as old metric plus some, let's say, unit time-like vector, you know, uh, the, the, product of, of the tensor product of some unit time-like vector with itself and adding it to the old metric. If that's a constant time-like vector field, I get a new Minkowski metric. It's still flat. It's just the... the I just widen the null cones at every point. So some of what used to be space-like vectors are now, are now time-like vectors. Now both of these are very simple geometrical operations. And what I would like now to have, and they, they both are characterized by, di by different representations of the Poincaré, of the Poincaré group in the, in the same Hilbert space by the Different, different sets of p's and q's. So they both are going to, be, they both should be represented if, let's say the, the original one, I'll write q and p for the guys that are associated with the original one and q prime and p prime for the ones that are, for the elements that are picked out by the representation of the Poincaré group for the new one. Then it should be the case that there exists, well, it is the case that there exists um, some operate some op some operator not definitely not unitary and pro and definitely not an isometry because I'm not uh, I'm not I, I'm not going to be preserving the um, the inner product but. Um, if it were uni if it were unitary, um, then I'd be then I'd be preserving the, I'd be preserving the norm of all the states. But what you but what used to be say a photon state is now not a photon state. So I'm pretty sure I'm not going to be preserving the norms of, of states. That's that. So I, I have not worked this out, but the, that that's my that's my intuition for why this the, for why this can't be a unitary operator. If I would love to be proved wrong, it'd be so much easier if it, if it were a unitary operator. Um, and so I would now I would like to be able to figure out what the struct what the structure of the of the, of these guys are for each of these two simple geometrical operations. And I've made some progress in the SO4. It's actually pretty straightforward. I haven't yet made progress. I haven't really tried that one. But I would love to, I would, this is the conclusion of my talk, very open-ended. I would love to have ideas. It, um, I would love to hear ideas about whether you think this is a fruitful way of thinking about um, how to represent an indefinite causal, uh, indefinite causal order as two sets of null cones on the, um, on, on the same manifold that are related by a geometrical operation 
that I then, tr I then tr translate into um, operator transformations on the Hilbert space via the induced representations of, of the Poincaré group. And if so, then what is the relation, if any, between these guys and, uh, pro and the process matrix formals? So uh, this, is my question, this is my question for you. I think I must have irritated Mario's because I, I, drove, I drove him away. Yeah, um, uh, if it does, so I, I'm, I'm writing it this way um, and because I'm actually not sure, at least in, uh, in this case, because if it does depend on P, then, the, then I'm, I wanna, so I'm gonna put the P dependence. I'm, I'm, I'm only writing this schematically. No. So I, I actually suspect that, it, that there will be mixing and it will depend on, on both the Qs and the Ps, but at least schematically, I can stick the p-dependence in these operators. But no, I, I, su I suspect you're exactly right, that, it will, that there will be mixing. In this case, um, there's definitely mixing. And in that case, I suspect there is, but I haven't been able to work it out because while ge geometrically, this is, a, this is a really simple operation, it's a re really simple to think about geometrically, uh, turning it into an turning it into an operator that's uh, that uh, that I can write as elements of the representation of the Poincaré group has so far eluded me. Oh, it, it, it won't be an element of a representation of the Poincaré group, but I want to try to represent it by combinations of elements of the, of the, of the Poincaré group. It definitely will not be uh, an, a member of the Poincaré group. I mean, because it, it changes the null cone, so it can't be. So what, what you have on the left-hand side is something which is uh, basically the KMC working for gravitational quantum switch. Mm -hmm. Right. But you can have, I mean, also something that's like that. Mm -hmm. but on the right hand side picture, there is something which, uh, when you turn, when you have a light mm -hmm. in the medium, you can slow up. Mm -hmm. Yes, that's exactly what I was thinking of. So you can make a, I mean, you, put, uh, you, you, you shine with a laser. Now, mm -hmm. of course, you cannot make it, but you imagine that you can mm -hmm. have a position of shining a laser or not shining the laser. Mm -hmm. Uh, I, well, I, I was thinking of um, I was I was rather thinking of a situation where you have a superposition of um, a dielectric and not a dielectric. Yeah. And, that would be the best as well. okay. and that and that and that and that would yeah, effectively be. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's the same because if yeah. you don't shine the laser, then it's kind of vacuum mm -hmm. velocity when you shine the laser or in medium, but when you shine it, mm -hmm. then you slow up even mm -hmm. more the light velocity, and uh, so you have something similar. Of that, right? mm -hmm. So, uh, do you, uh, is there any work done on how to represent uh, I I explicitly the uh, the indefinite causal order uh, for mm -hmm. the situations? No. How how do you how do you do it? How do you do it? No, I mean, how? Formalism is something like yes. No, no, no. So, so uh, uh, that's what I'm asking. So the, there are explicit representations of a, of, the, of an a definite causal order. I, I, I know. I, I know. I know. There, I know there is for the gravitational case, yes. but for the but for the for the op, for the laser case, uh, is no, 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 it's just an idea. oh I mean, oh it's not, no oh okay. Because oh thank thank you very much. But I mean the.
this, this, this can't be like a, a novel idea. So, like, some, y'all must have thought about trying to do this using, using changes of Q's and P's. No. No. <laughs> Not really, but what we are doing uh. is more like you have a points in space time. You have events, you have a domain. Mm -hmm. I mean, you have to somehow identify this, uh -huh. uh, this point with another, another Right, point. Uh, exactly. Identification, uh, rather thought about the identification of those. Yeah. yeah. But not really on the Okay. So, as I say, I mean, the, the, this this is relatively straightforward because I, you, you can write an element of SO4 as just an element of, um, of SO3 throwing you know throwing in some eyes, and so that that, that that's relatively straightforward, doing it, ch changing the Q's and the P's. But this, um, I have not been able to figure out at all. But but the the idea. So as I say, I, I was thinking I was thinking about it as being a superposition of dielectric and no dielectric. But your 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 uh, your example is, yeah. It's really the change of dielectric. Yeah. But anyway, all this what we took is that you say there is some control like a laser. Mm -hmm. So if the laser is on, mm -hmm. then and this is laser. Then right. when you uh, order it, mm -hmm. it's one. Mm -hmm. and then you, of course, it would be interesting to find the relation between these two. Mm -hmm. um, but then, for the superposition itself, you need also an operator acting in the superposition. Yes. That's, and that's the guy with the power yeah. that will act in the superposition. Mm -hmm. Now you can have a superposition of this element, for example, of laser on and off. Mm -hmm. And then you will have really, uh, and then maybe also some states in the space time here. Mm -hmm. And then when you act with this, you will have a, uh, this will, this will pick up the zero. So you have mm -hmm. zero, Q, one psi, plus one, Q prime. So that's the gist. That's what you will do. And so if there is a zone, you will have one of them. And it's off, then you will have mm -hmm. another Q. But the relation between them is something that would be interesting mm -hmm. to find. So you said you asked what, why I was sure that um, that, that, that this uh, yeah. that, that this transformation isn't unitary. Yes. I mean, uh, do, do you do you think it could be? Because it, it just seems to me like. It oh, what we have so far so far done is unitary. Really? But, so. But, uh, so the, the things that I becomes tricky is when these things are not orthogonal. Mm -hmm. Then, so if something is unitary in, for, in one space time, and something right. is unitary in another one, in itself, right. then even in the superposition, it will be unitary as long as these things are orthogonal to each other. So something I see. you can prove that something which is a controlled unitary, uh -huh. if, if these are orthogonal and these are unitary, then this thing this is whole thing is Right, that makes sense. And I believe that. But when you have kind of a fuzzy things, you say, mm -hmm. no, but these are not really fully uh, mm -hmm. orthogonal, then this proof doesn't go through. Mm -hmm. Then it's true. I don't and know. The, and then, but, but, there's, but uh, it's not necessarily the case that it's not unitary. You just can't prove that it's unitary in this way. In this way, yeah. yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. It could be also. It, it, could, it could be unitary, it could be not, but it, it's not. And, it, and it's really related to this kind of, kind of I don't know, sometimes you call this reference plane. Mm -hmm. Then, if these are not non ideal, then these sets yeah. are not at all. Mm -hmm. Then it could. Okay, so then, then I think this, this is not unitary. You can prove that mm -hmm. this is not unitary. But it doesn't okay. tell you that you should go this way. Right. So then you maybe should consider what is. For me, unitarity, like imagine you all only have uh, uh, mixed states, and you mm -hmm. have only a sub larger than you can imagine. Mm -hmm. Say it's not obvious because uh, it could be still unitary in certain sense, 
uh, that no information is lost, but you have no pure states, you have no scalar products, you right. cannot use the usual ways how to define this. Mm -hmm. Then I would take like, I don't know, let's take two, uh, the, uh, 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 let's assume that in the first case we have two states that are by the best measurement you can imagine distinguish from. Mm -hmm. And then if this uh, error of not distinguishing them or is preserved, mm -hmm. I would say, well, there is no loss in mm -hmm. information and, and maybe it's still kind of unitary. I see. Yeah, interesting, yeah. Okay. But, huh. I mean, I, I guess, I, I like trying to think of it in this way because I, I, I still don't feel like I fully di digested the process matrix formalism yet. And it's very, I find it very abstract. But I, 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 I like this way of thinking about it because I know how to relate the Qs and the Ps to space time, to space -time structure. And that's, okay, so uh, that's what I'm used to. Uh, at least if, if you think about that as a superposition of mm -hmm. classical uh, mm -hmm. light cones, mm -hmm. then this is a special case of the process matrix formalism in which we have uh, uh, superposition of causal orders, like mm -hmm. here. Position right. and really it's, you know, the process map formalism is a little bit more abstract. Mm -hmm. It incorporates this and incorporates also things that are not superposition of causal orders, but we don't know how to represent them. Like we don't know whether it's a mathematical artifact right. or it's real thing. So quantum switch, this is all like quantum switch, you know, mm -hmm. like uh, you have uh, something which defines the uh, light cone and the light mm -hmm. cone defines the so it's some additional mm -hmm. degree of freedom, total mm -hmm. superposition, mass left, right, whatever. And then you have uh, classical causal structure. But something which will be genuinely quantum, mm -hmm. which I don't know how it will. Like it's not superposition of these classical situations, but some kind of quantum interpretation mm -hmm. of this. I don't know how to represent in process metric formalism or I don't know. I mean, I mean anything that's, that includes, that isn't just a superposition, but in, includes fluctuations. I know some one. kind of yeah. Yes, yeah. No, no, I, I, no one knows how to handle that. Yeah. This one, you said that, um, that this is like the gravitational switch, but in, on mine, the, the only examples I've seen of the gravitational switch are the ones like in the paper that I discussed, um, that, yes. I, that I discussed with y'all, where um, where the causal order actually you know, completely but reverses, you not just slightly rotated. Yeah, but is that? You don't, but, but that means you put the huge mass that you reverse this, but mm -hmm. maybe you don't need to do it. Like you, you do it. So, so you can start with something which are two really uh, space-like separated events. Mm -hmm. That's the first situation. Then you put large mass around mm -hmm. one one of them. You deviate this. Mm -hmm. And so that, okay, let's say this is, you can have some identification of that mm -hmm. by some operation maybe. Mm -hmm. Then you put, so they are space-like separated. Then mm -hmm. you put Mm -hmm. Then they become finite. Right. Before you put the mass. Okay. But good. Yeah. This is good. This is this is this is this is exa this is exactly what I was trying. This is exactly what I was trying to capture. Good. But you don't then use this first one. You use yes. the second two. Okay. So. <laughs>